and police uh, forces. The murder of George Floyd has exposed something that we were aware of and have been talking about for decades. And it has been shelved, marginalized, pushed to the side. Uh, I want to bring attention to a young man by the name of Maurice Gordon out of uh, New York, the state of New York who was killed by a New Jersey trooper, I believe two days before the death of George Floyd. And obviously with the rise of everything that happened in Minneapolis, uh, this kind of went under, under the radar. There's still a lot of unanswered questions uh, to give you an idea of, of the basics of what I know so far and I'm still gathering information. Uh, this young man, uh, Carr, uh, stalled and stopped uh, on a uh, highway in New Jersey and a trooper pulled over to uh, offer assistance or whatever and they called a tow truck and somewhere between waiting on the tow truck the trooper shot him. Uh, I don't know uh, the details so I can't speak on the details. What I can tell you is that the state has not been very forthcoming with the details to the family. The family's attorney has been fighting and looking for answers, and there have been few answers given. This, at this point, is simply another unarmed black man who was shot and killed by a white police officer, and there's being little to nothing done about it. Again, I can't speak on the details. I can't speak on what the provocation was. I can't speak on any of that and be legitimate in my 
uh, addressing it. You know, it could be easy for me to go out and speculate and to speak based on the history, uh, but I would rather speak based on the facts. But what I can tell you right now is the facts are that the, the police department and the district attorney's office are not being very forthcoming. And this is an ongoing thing. This is a new, you, you guys know about Breonna Taylor. You know about Amara Aubrey. And I can go on and on and on of how many black men and women have been killed. Sandra Bland at the hands are in the custody of police. Uh, and we need to really and truly understand that. One thing that really truly helped me, believe it or not, uh, one thing that really truly helped me uh, gain an understanding of this complex dynamic uh, as it pertains to the relationship between police officers and black men specifically is a book by uh, Norm Stamper, who is a former police chief in San Diego and Seattle. And uh, Norm Stamper uh, wrote a book called Breaking Rank, and that's exactly what Norm did. He broke rank. And if you don't understand the term of breaking rank, it's often often used in situations where police forces, uh, military, and even in corporate upper upper the upper echelon of corporate structure, where there is a code of going along and following and alignment with what is expected. You know, with police, it's the blue wall of silence and the blue code. And Norm broke ranks with that. And he, t he did a tell-all book. And in this book, he talks about the inherent fear that white police officers have of black men. And the bigger and the darker the man, the greater the fear. Uh, the man doesn't have to be armed. There's this belief. And I can tell you that this belief is highly conditioned and promoted through uh, a narrative written by mainstream media that black men are superhumanly strong, um, that there's an animalistic thirst to harm and to hurt and to kill, um, and a bunch of other things. Then you have to add in the social dynamic of knowing deep down inside what you've done to the black man. From, from a white male perspective and understand that if the black man ever has the upper hand, what it might look like for him. And you can start to see the development of this social dynamic between white cops and black men. Now, it's definitely a lot more convoluted and complex than just that, but that's a great place to start in understanding the truth of what is going on between our men and our women. I mean, our men and our pol and, and the police department. I want to really and truly push us to a place to where we are really questioning what we see and what is happening with our our men, and that we start to individually and collectively hold the people who are responsible accountable and we when i say responsible i mean from the person who pulls the trigger to the one who has given them the authority and sanction and covering and protection to feel comfortable enough with taking a life with no fear of retribution or consequence See, the thing is, and I've said this many times before that, it is going to be at the end of the day, the consequence that we apply to any action that we do not approve of or desire that will determine whether it stops or not. Pleading to someone's moral compass or pleading to someone's sense of righteousness has not worked well for us. So what do we do? We sit up and say, okay, if you do that, this is what we're going to do. If you do that, this is how we're going to respond. We're going to respond quickly and decisively, and we will make sure that you understand how we feel about it. Our actions will be the representation of how we feel about it. We're not going to beg you. We're not going to plead with you. We're not going to negotiate with you. 
that the black life is too valuable to negotiate. We're simply going to charge you the cost. And we can come to a conclusion very quickly what the cost for a black life is. But what we will not do is sit up and consistently do what we've done in the past. And that's forgive. That's to sit around and beg. That's to sit around and try to convince someone that they're doing you wrong. One of the fastest way to let a person know that they step across the line is to give them enough pushback that it puts them back across the line decisively and forcefully. You don't allow somebody to step on you consistently over and over and over again. Derek Chauvin's knee in the neck of George Floyd was both real and symbolic of what we experience. And it's time that we take their knee off our neck, their foot off our neck. It's time that we do it. You don't ask them, you remove it. By any means necessary. And on that note, I'm out. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. Yeah, sounded better than Jay. People talk Real about talk, it. Exactly. All of the elements.